Remy Mizuchi, cold-blooded blonde viper. Eldest daughter of the Mizuchi family. She's ready to eliminate even her own sister with ruthless <laughs> precision. Mercy, not her Bad girls still wear white. <laughs> With a gaze as piercing as her intentions, she navigates a world of deceit and manipulation, leaving a trail of calculated chaos in her wake. Rumi Mizuchi, draped in military fatigues tucked into slick knee-high leather boots, is the baddest of them all. Sure, guys like Frieza blow up planets while they sip wine from their spaceships, but Remy takes it personal and does everything in her power to break her opponent psychologically. No plan is too complex or devious as she strikes with her whip that acts as an extension of her malevolence. A serpentine instrument that enforces her dominion with every precise and calculated lash. Why, might you ask? Rummy doesn't do things because she's some tragic, sympathetic villain. She does them because it's her will to power. A trope in manga that is all too underutilized for female antagonists. That's what makes many of Shinji Wada's villains so great. They are evil because they can be. And to the critics that do desire sympathy, please consider that some people are simply this way. And whether you find this compelling is but a matter of preference. One that is to mine that I will feverishly outline in this essay. Remy is the first major antagonist to Skabandeka. Prior to that, Haro and Saki largely dealt with petty crimes. This arc is so popular that it's been adapted into the 1991 OVA on screen and redrawn in the 2020 manga reboot. And for good reason. It's one of the best in the series. The conflict begins as the Mizuchi sisters enroll at Saki's former high school. It's all a Ponzi scheme, you see. Their evil father chose that particular school because it was just high enough that all sorts of rich assholes would be attending. What better way than to siphon and embezzle their money through bribes? The youngest of the sisters is an intention-seeking megalomaniac that doesn't care what it takes to be famous. The middle child is a hotshot biker gang leader with only one true love. Lie for it, die for it. Money. And the eldest, Remy, the lesbian psychopath without fear that desires only to exploit and achieve her desires no matter the cost. I mean, what do you expect from a girl raised around vipers since she was an infant? It is through her cold and calculated plans that her sister's ambitions are realized. Meet Junko. She's an earnest art student from a poor family with a dream. Her mom worked hard to send her to that fancy school, and she managed to get there through the power of hard work and talent. One day, she hoped to become a great artist like her late father and make something of herself so that she may give not just herself a good life, but her ill mother as well. So what does Remy think of all of that? Well, her little sister wants to be a painter so she can be famous, see? Which prompts Remy to threaten to murder the school art teacher's little daughter with envenomation if he doesn't try to get Junko to stop painting. In the OVA, she takes it several steps further and... has her abducted, drugged, and I'm sure you can guess what else based on the video playing right now. OVA Remy is actually insane. The manga is a bit more tame, with middle sister Ayumi sending one of her thugs to run over the would-be artist's hand. Junko is but one of many casualties in Skibendeka that you hope the best for, but the best never comes. From there, Remy buys out Junko's debt from their landlord. Her mother's not in good health and Junko works when she's not in school to support her. 
and she cooks too. They were late on the rent and only had a couple of days to come up with the money. She was doing her absolute best. But Remy, oh, the serpentine blonde vixen, would care not. As she sent goons over to steal all of Junko's paintings, which was legal, I guess. But the guys did rough up Junko and her mom just because they could. In the meantime, she would also be organizing an avalanche, a bus to be derailed and driven off a cliff into the ocean, and a fire to burn her classmates alive. If you think this is the worst of it, you're in for a ride yet. Junko's mom was hospitalized and old man Mizuchi bribed the police about forthcoming accidents. And then, Remy sent the ever-loving gift of pit vipers to Junko's mom in the hospital. Loose ends need to be tied up, after all. It's not long after that the series of accidents succeeded, for the most part. The newspapers roared with sympathy for old man Mizuchi, the doomed politician, and the school's chairman and principal felt the pressure of angry parents, which would force their resignations. All was falling into place, and the Mizuchis would rule the school. To Remy, this was but a small act of genocide to achieve her ambitions, after all. Who would think a trio of high school girls would be capable of something so off the rails? Pun intended. And so, Junko fell into the Viper's pits of despair. She sold her body for pennies, and then arguably her greatest work is copied and presented as another's. She was made a fool in front of the very art exhibition she was to enter. The teacher she thought she could trust betrayed her, and then, she ran away, only to be murdered by Ayumi. Oh dear Ayumi, the woman greedier than a Meowth had all that was dear taken from her. The hordes of cash stored in an underground vault on her racing track. By whom, might you ask? Why, none other than Remy herself. And in the moment she attempted to defend herself with the weapon gifted to her by Remy, she ended her own life inadvertently. You see, the shotgun was rigged. A Yumi who proclaimed money over sisterhood got a fatal dose of her own venom that night. And she wouldn't be the only Mizuchi to fall that week. Saki and her friends exposed Emmy for her misdeeds in public, and along with her father, was arrested and escorted out of the building only for them to be shot up in a drive-by directed by Remy. Emmy would perhaps survive, but her father would be pronounced dead at the scene, all to suppress evidence and reign supreme. If there was a loose end, any asset she could seize, then that was that. What is family but a stepping stone to a maniacal woman hellbent on accumulating power? Evil is, in her own words, beautiful. It is her will to power and a testament to her supreme stature. The blood of the innocent waters the flowers of evil. And that is the beauty she takes in her gaze and sighs a breath of admiration. Her goal is to rule the world of evil, even at the cost of her own life. She is the metaphoric wolf in sheep's clothing, the pretty rich high school student that could do no wrong, dressed in white but Saki would see through that, prompting her to become Remy's antithetical, the rival that she would give up everything for. And as their battle came to a head, Remy overwhelmed Saki, but somehow she persevered and forced her foe to retreat. In an action sequence fitting of a classic Arnold Schwarzenegger film, Remy escaped for a moment on a helicopter, only for Saki to have attached herself via yo-yo. The blonde scoffed and took the pilot's revolver. It's the end for Saki. Her last hurdle is the elimination of the one woman that could actually stop her. But by chance, Saki threw the gift from Junko and knocked Remy into the pilot, causing the chopper to crash in the woods. In typical Wada fashion, Saki emerged from the flames with Remy in cuffs. Now you would think that's the end of Remy Mizuchi, wouldn't you? 
Certainly the OVA stops there, but the manga wouldn't let the greatest villain Shoujo had seen yet end there. No, instead Remy's put in the same reformatory Saki originally escaped from, Hell's Fortress. It's there that she learned Remy had been using a body double and the girl she thought she could trust was an assassin. Turns out Remy escaped through the giant garbage disposal in the basement, a feat only Saki and the would-be killer Kasawari could follow up on. This is the magic of Wada Shoujo. Kasawari wants to beat someone as strong or stronger than she is, and Saki agrees. That's the life they live. Yet another one you hope doesn't die. But Wada is not so generous. The blossoming of friendship is withered in blood. Remy had escaped by diving off a 35 meter waterfall after managing to escape through the whirlwind of blades above. She would be watching Saki's every move because she hated her and she wanted to know everything about her to break her completely so that she may die in agony. It's only downhill for Saki from there. Turns out she had a sister, see? A rich girl. While Saki's mother was arrested and put on death row for burning their house down and killing their father, her sister was adopted by a wealthy family. Saki, on the other hand, would be nothing but a delinquent. Remy would uncover all of this and devise a plot to make a Spanish soap opera's writing team blush. Remy initially went to Europe, which is what prompted Saki to investigate Hell's Fortress from the get-go. Yes, she was in Europe, but instead left the girl that fell in love with her and the evil crime syndicate she had been pursuing for Saki. That love interest would end up being one of the final antagonists, by the way, which is fitting in its own way if you know the ending. I digress. Remy came back for the sole purpose of torturing Saki, breaking down everything she had left. So let's break down her... Breakdown? Yeah. Perhaps Saki's best friend, her creepy male stalker that Wada's female assistants seemed to like, and I guess the readers in the 70s as well, had this whole marriage to Saki's sister arranged. It vaguely reminds me of that one Pokemon episode about Kojiro's family in season one. Well, after finally deciding to go through with it and giving up on Saki, he marries her sister, Miyuki, through an arranged marriage. But on the site of their wedding, something is a foul. The bouquet Saki caught ended up having a deadly spider that was put to sleep with a powerful drug so that it would awaken later to kill whoever would have caught the bouquet. Saki would race to the villa where Sanbei and Miyuki would spend their wedding night together. But the proto-Zar Baldi Bald is shot several times in the chest and left to die. Soon after, Miyuki ran away to see her mother in prison and manipulated her. Saki is the villain. Saki wants to be adopted by Miyuki's family so she can steal all their money. She'll protect her from Saki. Poor, poor Miyuki. She'll get her dear old mother out of prison, right? What if I told you Miyuki was actually Remy this whole time? And she kidnapped the real Miyuki, swapped faces with her after extensive plastic surgery, locked her in a basement underneath a vacation home, and killed Sanbei herself. That is the level Remy's hate drives her to. Because her hate isn't normal. It's abject in all the worst ways. It's oppressive and domineering to completely batter her target until they've crumbled. And that hate was all damage to her ego. She was the best. All her plans were perfect. The crime syndicate in Europe wanted her. The sky wasn't the limit because there was no limit. But the fact she was beat, that was the problem. She would prove she was superior and that her rival was no rival at all. Skibendeka did it before Dragon Ball Z. I'll say that much. Through an elaborate plan that involved burning her own face with acid, Saki's mother was broken out of prison with Remy's aid. Meanwhile, Saki herself went away to the very home where the real Miyuki was held captive underground. It's there that they had a good time. <laughs> Remy enjoyed her time with Saki, 
I think the implications here are obvious. Remy's a lesbian. There's extreme homoerotic tension between the two. Wada wrote a long AU in 2004 about Remy and Saki being together, with the former even leaving her lover, again, for Saki. It seems he wrote out what he implied, and what would have happened if this world were just a little different. In any case, Remy kidnapped the man that made Saki's yo-yos and had one made specifically for her mother, who she informed of their whereabouts. Saki and Remy traveled up a mountain to find her mother waiting, where Remy flipped a switch and cried that Saki was going to kill her. From there, it was an intimate battle between mother and daughter as Remy fleed the scene away on a helicopter. To make things even more crazy, Remy's underlings were directed to shoot up her old school and bomb Jin's office. But that's only the beginning of our villainous terrorism. While Saki was hospitalized from the duel with her mother, Remy planted bombs all around Tokyo. Try as she and her team might have, they all began to go off. One after another, buildings fell, people died, and chaos erupted. One section of the city was left unscathed. However, the place where Remy dumped the real Miyuki, who had Remy's face. At the same time, news stations were broadcasting Remy's face all over the air. As Saki raced to the harbor to find her now noir-haired viper, Miyuki's adoptive grandfather found her. Shotgun aimed and ready to fire. But then, Saki's mother intervened and killed him. In a panic, Miyuki ran only for her mother dearest to shoot her. Yes, she killed her own daughter. And so her mother ends her own life with a cyanide tablet in her tooth. In a flash, Saki went from having a dysfunctional family to no family at all. Remy Mizuchi succeeded. She murdered just about everyone there was in her life, only falling short of Jin and his office staff as they miraculously survived the bombing. As Remy headed for international waters, preparing to board a submarine, she felt regret. No, not regret for what she had done, but regret for Saki, that she did not evade the trap she set out for her. In truth, she never enjoyed herself more than when she was plotting to make her suffer. And in that haze of thinking, she could not discern whether or not Saki was chasing her or she was chasing Saki. It's a mixture of both, in truth. It would be moments until the story reached its climax, as the boat was hit with an explosion. Remy, strangely, felt a sense of relief. Could it be? Yes, it was Saki. Rather than feeling her plans may have been foiled, she was happy. She was happy to die because she had met Saki, the type of enemy that she could love, that could match her and push her to her limits, the yin to her yang. They fought one last time, and in the end, both were thrown overboard in a gigantic explosion into the bay's depths. That's where Skibendeka was supposed to end, but the manga was so popular that Wada was pressured to continue the story so instead of Remy and Saki dying with reciprocated feelings only divided by the evils of truth and love, or <clears throat> I mean the line of justice and evil, Saki survived somehow and ended up in America. The following arc is very weird, and probably my least favorite, but it's still really good overall. In any case, someone like Frieza could enslave an entire race and then blow up a planet but by comparison to the evil hatred that embodies the ambition of Remy Mizuchi, it's almost juvenile. This is a character that is cartoonishly evil because it thrills her. It's Nietzsche, her will to power, whereby she follows a path of relentless domination, driven not by a desire for order or control, but rather by an insatiable lust for power and the visceral joy of imposing her will as she so pleases. Remy Mizuchi's villainy isn't rooted in a pursuit of some misguided notion of justice or even a quest for domination for the sake of order. Instead, her actions seem to emerge from a nihilistic drive, 
a desire to revel in chaos. Asserting her dominance over others merely as a byproduct of her perverse pleasures. This Nietzschean aspect of her character sets her apart from conventional antagonists, painting her as a symbol of unrestrained and chaotic malevolence. Her will to power, unburdened by moral constraints, creates a character whose actions are unpredictable and unrelenting. Once again, while characters like Frieza might have specific motivations tied to their sense of order or hierarchy, Remy Mizuchi's brand of villainy is anarchic and hedonistic. In this sense, she transcends the conventional boundaries of villainy, becoming a personification of the potential destructive power of the human psyche. Nietzsche's philosophy encompasses the idea that individuals seek out not only to assert control over external forces, but also to dominate and shape their own destiny. Remy exemplifies this internal struggle navigating a chaotic world with unwavering determination to shape her own narrative. Her actions aren't just about domineering others, they're a form of self-empowerment a rebellion against the perceived constraints of societal norms and morality. In embracing chaos, she rejects the traditional values that bind others, opting instead for a path where power becomes an end in itself. Nietzsche posited the idea of the Ubermensch, a being that transcends conventional notions of morality and foregoes its own values, and thus possesses an Uberwaltigen nature. Basically, Remy and her ruthless pursuit embodies a kind of Nietzschean overhuman, defying moral boundaries to create a space where power is the ultimate virtue. Her actions, while abhorrent by societal standards, mirror Nietzsche's challenge to reassess established moral frameworks and consider the subjective nature of good and evil. In a manner of speaking, Remy's pretty blatant that she likes being evil but I digress. You could say she's become an archetype one might describe as das Volkenleib, or the perfect woman. I've been meaning to make this video for many months now, but haven't had the energy to actually make it. And I can already tell you that like going through the process for this entire video has been one of my absolute favorites thus far. Oh, by the way, there was also a manga collab Shinji Wada did with Kaoru Shintami called uh, Black Lullaby or Sand Rose vs. Skavendeka Black Lullaby, whatever. I skimmed it and it seems to be one of the Sand Rose characters is cloned by Remy and she tries to kill some of them and then Saki kills Remy by knocking her into lava. It's weird, but a kind of cool story. I'll have to do a proper read of it sometime and then maybe a video, we'll see. But for now, I'm signing off. Catch you on the flip side.